going to be awesome. So here we go, real treat. Uh, my name is Michael Walter. I'm the director of digital and emerging media here at Cooper Hewitt, and uh, tonight is Game Changers. Game Changers is Cooper Hewitt's program of conversations with influential and innovative thinkers and industry industry leaders. Uh, and I have to first thank uh, Tim Brown, CEO of IDEO, uh, whose support and generosity makes this series possible. If you've ever been to a Game Changers before, you already know you're in for a treat tonight. Uh, while we're at it, the next Game Changer, if you're interested, is on June 1st, and that will feature Jenny Sabin. But tonight, we have a special guest, Liz Ogbu. Uh, Liz Ogbu is the founder, principal, and general genius behind Studio O, where she works as a designer, a urbanist, a social innovation strategist, and many other things. <laughs> I, unfortunately, only heard about Liz just this past November when I was attending the Museum Computer Network Conference in Minneapolis, where she gave the keynote. And when I was sitting there watching her giving the keynote, I knew we had to get her here. So I'm really excited that she's here tonight. Uh, but Liz has a, actually a long relationship with Cooper Hewitt. She was featured in our Design for the Other 90% exhibition, which was in 2007, um, and was the first in our series of exhibitions on uh, social responsibility, social impact, all those sorts of good things. And incidentally, the third in that series is coming up and will open this fall. September 30th, uh, and that will be called By the People, Designing a Better America. Uh, when I was watching Liz speak at MCN, she was talking about cook stoves. Uh, it was really just a fascinating topic and project. I was really intrigued by just the concept of how a cook stove is sort of this fundamental thing around the world that everyone needs in order to prepare food, uh, and how she sort of approached the problem. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot here at Cooper Hewitt uh, in all of our lectures and our exhibitions and just as, as a staff is uh, human-centered design. And Liz is out there actually doing human-centered design. Often her projects seem to begin and end and take place in the places where the projects are deployed. Um, she's there on the ground talking to people and this was one of the things that I just really uh, enjoyed learning about. You guys are in for a really great treat tonight. I'm going to keep this really short and welcome Liz Ogu to the stage. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and uh, thank you to the Cooper Hewitt for making this possible. I'm really excited to be here. So when I was asked to talk, I was asked to give a little bit about the arc of my career and not just the projects that I'm currently working on. And it's sort of been an interesting challenge to do because as I was thinking about it, I realized that over the period of time that I've been working in the design for social innovation space before it was even called design for social innovation, um, the whole entire industry has changed. And so in some ways, um, especially because I had a wonderful opportunity to be involved with two of the leading nonprofits that helped usher in that change, um, looking at the arc of my projects in some ways kind of talks about where the field was and where it's going to. So I'm kind of excited to talk through that and um, hopefully have a discussion about that afterwards. So if I think about what kind of was my first inspiration around doing this kind of work, I have to say that first I'm the weird child in my family who drew. Um, my parents were social scientists and so while you know we did talk about like anthropology and health at the dinner table because they wanted us to learn, um, I would go back and draw things. And so for me, when I stumbled across architecture, I was looking for a way to marry the design part with the social part that, from my upbringing, felt so critical to the way in which we understand the world. And uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Wellesley, where I could do that as part of my major. And then I spent a year in Sub-Saharan Africa on a traveling fellowship. And for me, that experience was super pivotal. Uh, because as I traveled uh, to 10 countries spending time there, I became really compelled by the fact that a lot of professional designers were doing stuff for the government, they were doing stuff for uh, sort of the middle and upper class and expats, but they weren't doing stuff for the large majority of people that I was encountering every day on the streets. And um, this picture is actually from a more recent visit when I was on a technical advisory team for the World Bank. But it was interesting because one of the things that we saw, we went to Durban, which is on the eastern coast, and we spent a lot of time with the traders in this real one dense pocket of informal um, settlements of work junction, which was uh, profiled in the last design for the other 90% exhibit. 
And it was really interesting because as part of the human-centered design process, you spend a lot of time talking to individuals, really trying to understand their needs and desires. And um, I came across a woman who was named Bickley, who was actually a street trader. She sold fruits and vegetables and talked a little bit about her life. And one of the things that um, she talked about was how hard it was and you know, how little money that she got and the inability for her to be able to travel back to her home so she was sleeping on the street and finding other accommodations. But she also talked about the fact that every Friday, all the traders in her area would get together, they would sweep the streets because the city wasn't doing it, but they felt they wanted to keep the place clean. And they would also um, collect a little bit of fruits and vegetables from each other's stand and cook a soup and give that soup to the local AIDS clinic. And so in all the conversations that people had about the traders, they were used to say, well, we have to figure out how to help them. We have to figure out how to build this for them so that they're not trading on the streets. Nobody had the conversation with them about, well, what kinds of stuff are they doing? Instead of looking at this as kind of fetishized poverty, how can we give them not, you know, that oft used phrase, not a um, handout, but a hand up? And so for me, this idea of design, that it's not just about helping people who have nothing, but it's about helping people be able to thrive within their lives, has really, I think, described the arc of what I look to do in my projects. And in this case, you know, one of the comments that she said to me was, you know, we are not animals, we want a quality space. She wanted some space that would actually allow her to be able to live a better life and build upon the things that she was already doing. So that kind of sets the stage for a little bit of the things that I find when I'm out in the world doing my projects. And now I kind of want to take you through a couple of them so you can see what that actually plays out um, in terms of actual design projects. So the first project I'm going to share is actually the one that was um, profiled in the first design for the other 90% exhibit, uh, the day labor station. It's a project that I did when I was at Public Architecture, which is a small nonprofit based in San Francisco, uh, whose mission is to use uh, design, particularly architecture, to try and create positive social impact. And uh, this was a project that we worked on for a number of years. Uh, at Public Architecture, the idea was that uh, we had one really well-known program uh, called the 1% where we recruited architecture firms to do pro bono service, working with local nonprofits in their community. And then we had another side of the organization that actually did projects. And a fair number of our projects actually weren't commission-based, meaning that somebody came up to us and said, we want you to do this for us. It was us out being out in the world, um, looking at the different problems we could see and actually interacting with people on the ground to understand, well, what could we do to improve the situation? And so in this case, one of the um, challenges that we came across was day labor work. So um, day laborers are um, you know, folks who look for a day's work for a day's wages. Uh, there are over 100,000 men and women who look for day labor work every day in the US. Uh, the vast majority of the sites, uh, roughly about 75%, are informal. So there's street corners, Home Depot parking lots, gas stations, et cetera. And at those sites, there's no access to water, to toilets, or to shelter, more often. And so we felt that this was an issue of basic human dignity. It was something that we could do to make a change. So we spent actually many years going out to street corners across the country and talking to day laborers and trying to understand, was there something that we could do to help improve the situation? And uh, one of the things we found is that at the time we were working on this project, so we started about 2005, 2006, is that there are actual worker centers at the time. There was probably about 60 to 70 in the country, but the vast majority of them were like construction office trailers or church basements. There were spaces that had been designed for other uses that were being repurposed to accommodate this. And they were basically asking for the day labor system to fit itself within the building. Um, and we wanted to find a way of how do we understand how the day labor system operates and design something that could best accommodate that. So we spent a lot of time talking to the workers and one of the things that we found is first and foremost, it was really important to have visual transaction with each employer. So day laborers are actually highly organized, but what they find is that they want to be able to see every employment transaction. So we designed a system where the idea is that we'd always have that maximum visual access. I also found that when we went to a lot of sites that the day laborers, even if their system of organization was that it was going to be first come, first serve, um, and or that everybody was doing a free for all, that there was some level of organization and they really actually liked having space to be able to meet. And then finally, when we went and observed uh, the sites, we found that the peak hiring period was often between 6 to 9 a.m., but a lot of the workers stayed around for the majority of the day, 
partly because they were hoping to get somebody who might be coming a little bit late to hire somebody, um, but also this was sort of their community, it was a place to hang out. Uh, and we also found at the same time, we were hearing that about 50% of the people who were hiring the day laborers were homeowners, and they were often asking, hey, I want somebody who speaks English. And so actually getting some sort of skills was important to getting them to be more employable. And so one of the other things we decided to do was also create something that could be flexible enough to be turned into a classroom. And then based on all the things we heard, we started looking at this idea of why don't we create a kit of parts um, that could be easily deployable, knowing that at the different sites, the needs were going to change in different ways. And so this is an example of a prototype that we were proposing for a site in LA that actually was going to accommodate uh, almost 200 people. And so you can see that the uh, system actually mended itself a little bit. So, the other sort of interesting thing about this project is that from architecture terms, it just kind of talked about all the pieces that we were looking at, which really came from the interviews, but then there's this whole other part about the day labor system itself having to do with the fact that the majority of day laborers are actually immigrants. And in particular, there's um, no firm figures, but the last time a study was conducted, which was probably about 10 years ago, estimates were about 60 to 67 percent of the workers are undocumented immigrants. And so that was actually also an issue in understanding how this thing needed to work and what it could do. And so for us, it was really interesting of taking on this challenge of what did it mean to operate in this space. And this idea that day labor work is actually not new. It's been around for centuries. And in earlier times in this um, country, it was actually the dock workers. And it was always immigrants. People would come first time. This was a way that they began to enter into the normative workforce. And so the fact that this time we associated with undocumented mostly Latino immigrants is just a product of where we are in the time. But this idea of using this as an entry point to being able to have a normative job, and also for many of them, a lot of the stuff we heard in our interviews represented things that we say are like kind of core American values. They came here for a better life for themselves and their children. And so for us, we realized we couldn't just put out a piece of architecture and say, hey, great, we've solved the problem. But in order to get this thing to take hold, we actually also had to address this other uh, messaging and uh, cultural, social element of the project. Uh, so with a lot of the proposals that we did, we actually looked for what are ways that this is not just about shelter for the workers, but it's actually an act of community building. Um, one of the things that, uh, so we were, you know, the peak of this project was kind of around 2007, 2008, and that was the last time that there was an immigration bill before this most recent go-around in Congress. And one of the things that we heard is that a lot of the groups felt that the failure of the legislation uh, previously wasn't so much that um, it was a bad legislation, but it was when you looked out into the streets at who was protesting, it, you saw a sea of brown faces. And frankly, if you're a politician and you're thinking who's going to come and vote for me in election time, it wasn't the people you saw protesting. And so they wanted to look for ways of how could we integrate um, immigrants into the community so that the next time that the legislation came up, it wasn't so much that you're seeing the sea of brown faces, but you're seeing the sea of also middle class white voters who are compelled because now it's no longer those people who I feel bad for, but it's my daughter's best friend's family. Um, so we started to look for what are ways that we could propose community building as part of the project. So in this case, uh, it was a proposal to do a community garden that could be jointly tended by the area residents because there's a nearby housing development and the day laborers. It's a point to sort of say that the day laborer station itself was a steward for the site. And through that, you kind of change up the relationship and the narrative associated with the workers. Um, so, as has already been said, we had the pleasure of being able to show this project at the last design for the 90% exhibit. Um, we built a full-scale uh, section of the project. Um, it was the first time I had a lot of experience wrapping billboard vinyl on panels. I do not recommend that as a way to go. Um, but, you know, it was really, it was great. And through that, we actually got a lot of attention for the project, and um, I spent many months crisscrossing around the country and even going to Canada, um, because it was actually an issue that was facing a lot of communities, and a lot of people were really frustrated. They had tried to deal with it through legal grounds, usually got tossed out of court. Um, you know, you had Home Depot being angry about what was happening and yelling at cities. Cities were angry at Home Depot. Communities were angry at everybody. And so people were just looking for a new solution. And so we had a lot of great, interesting conversations, both with city officials and immigrant rights groups, 
But we launched this project um, right about the time of the recession. And so what's really interesting is that we got a lot of feedback from people about the project. And so um, this is actually a poster that we created for uh, the Wholesome Awards, which was an international competition that we won for the project. And in it, uh, there are actually texts from emails that I had received as part of the project. And coming from California, a lot of people are very sunny about no, oh, great, you're doing something for the day laborers, that's amazing. Um, and then, you know, I presented this in Texas, and uh, I was on the local news, and that was the first, next day I got hit, my first hate mail, and uh, one of the groups we were dealing with was like, well, now you really know you're doing something. If somebody's sending you hate mail, that's awesome. Um, but, you know, it was kind of appalling, because it would be stuff like, build it and we will burn it down with those nasty Mexicans. But I think the thing that was important to us was, actually, I was really excited to get the hate mail, not as a badge of courage, but just because I think if we're not stirring up conversations, then we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And in this particular case, if you think about what we normally call success in architecture, this was a bit of a failure. Because we had tried to launch it right about the time of the recession, even though we got a lot of interest, when the schools were being closed and the other services cut, it was really a hard proposition for a lot of cities to say that they're going to spend $100,000 on something that they felt and that would be seen in the community as mostly supporting undocumented immigrants. And so it ended up not getting built at all, but for me it was a super interesting project to see we found that with the groups that we were working with on the immigration rights side, this was the first time that they started talking about spaces as connected to the dignity of the workers and the population that they were dealing with. And I think that was a real important shift. Within architecture circles, we started to see that, I mean, still today, even though I haven't touched this project in six years, I'm still seeing it written up in different places because it sort of speaks to people as an inspirational model of what design can do. And for me, it was also really interesting to see that we were trying always to get the big station. That, that was what we were going for. And I think what I came to understand is that when you are tackling these big problems, actually approaching it from a more tactical standpoint, where you're kind of doing a little bit at a time and building off of small successes, is an important way to think about making that overall big change. And that's something that eventually comes through in a lot of the different projects that I do now. Um, but it kind of all started there. So uh, after public architecture, I ended up going to work for IDEO.org. Um, so IDEO.org is a sister nonprofit of IDEO, uh, the global design and innovation company. And for me, it was a really interesting experience because I did not touch a building for most of that year. And was sort of first to learn about design and think of design in broader terms. Uh, so design of systems, design of social enterprises, design of programs. But what are the many languages of design and how can you use that in order to create impact? And following uh, the year-long fellowship that I did at IDEO.org, I then went on to found Studio O. One of the first projects I had was uh, with Jacaranda Maternity, which is a maternal health social enterprise that's based in Nairobi. And I actually collaborated with um, another woman, um, Rika Shiori Clark, who had been a co-fellow with me um, and founded her own studio after she left. And so together we spent a couple weeks in Nairobi doing field work. And the challenge that they had really asked us to take on was their whole model was how do they revamp maternal health care within Kenya, knowing all the issues that come up, um, and how can they create a better standard of care, but do it from a patient-centered way. And so they were really interested in our process because it seemed a good marriage to the things that they were doing. And in particular, the challenge that they wanted us to address is that they felt like they had set up this new clinic and this new model to actually treat patients in a different way and increase the quality of both care and outcomes. But they were finding that while they were getting a lot of people in the door to see them um, while the time they were pregnant, that the women were actually going elsewhere to deliver their babies. And this was really problematic for them because their business model was structured on the fact that they would get paid when they delivered the baby at the clinic. And so for them, they were really challenged to how could they be sustainable. And so when we talked to them, they had reams of quantitative data showing this was what was happening. But in all the numbers, there wasn't anything to tell them exactly why it was happening. What was it that the women weren't finding within the clinic that Jack Rodney needed to change to be able to set up a situation where they would deliver their babies there. It was also not just about a uh, business thing, but also it, part of the reason why they set up had to do with the standard of care in the other hospitals. They wanted to figure out how to make sure that the women were getting the full standard of care throughout the entire pregnancy cycle, which includes birth. 
So we spent time um, in the clinic um, talking to the nurses and the way in which nurses had been set up was a way to like, be much friendlier to the patients, really kind of understanding what their needs and what they were going through and really be in a relational uh, set up with the patients to be able to get them to trust them. And so after talking to the nurses, we then said, well, let's go and talk to uh, the patients. And we went out and we found, um, we found uh, patients who had uh, been there and had their babies there and were thinking about it, or we also found people who hadn't used them. And I think part of the reason why we were hired was because of the fact that we were architects as well, um, and both had that background, and so um, Jack Rhonda actually thought, well, maybe some of the issue has to do with the clinics themselves. Maybe they're not working, and that's why the patients aren't coming back. And so when we went in, we spent a lot of time trying to understand, well, what was the process of decision making? How did you, you know, what did you do when you got pregnant? Uh, what, where did you plan for your birth? And not just trying to figure out specifically around the healthcare itself, but their entire lives, because it was really important for us to understand how they situated that decision making. And if you focus just on the problem itself, you often don't get the full scope of uh, content that you need to be able to make an effective decision. Um, so we spent a lot of time hanging out with mothers and very cute babies um, and then we also because it's important to understand the entire ecosystem we also spent time visiting other clinics because we wanted to understand how they worked and not just clinics that were um, competitors like other private clinics we also went to the public hospital and we also went to high-end private clinics um, so this is one of the ones that came up often when people were like well if I had money I would go to such and such um, and so we wanted to understand, well, what did they have there that made it seem so special? And then we also found we needed to talk to the husbands. So it was really interesting because Jack Arrival's assumption was that maybe part of the challenge was had to do with the husbands because they are the ones who provide the money for the women to be able to use in the clinic. And so when we went and we talked to the husbands, and it was really fascinating because most of them said, yeah, that's a woman's thing. I don't deal with that. Um, I either trust my um, wife to make that decision, or what we found is actually they were going to their mothers as proxies for them, because their mother's a woman, so therefore she would know what the right decision to be. But nowhere in uh, the discussions with Jacaranda had they looked at the idea of the mother-in-law perhaps being one of those influencers that they needed to talk to. Um, and so the idea that, well, it's great that you're organizing education pro and outreach programs for the husbands, but you might want to also consider doing that for their mothers as well, was something that couldn't have come through the spreadsheets that they had where they were surveying where people were going, but did come through the actual act of sitting in people's homes and interviewing them. Um, and then we also um, decided to shadow the nurses who were doing different things outside of the clinic. And so um, this woman, Carol, had was part of a pilot program that would go in and do postpartum visits. And in this, I think the best way to describe us is a fly on the wall. I mean, every now and then we had to hold the baby. But for the most part, we were just observing what the interaction was, and actually um, there are elements from this visit that became a cornerstone of one of the things that we proposed to Jack um, And then the other part of the process that I think is always super important is that it's not just about watching people in action or interviewing people, but sometimes there's also an element of immersing yourself and putting yourself in the shoes of the target user groups. Um, and so the, in this case, um, we realized that we, for two weeks, we've been having conversations with the nurses about like, well, tell us what you do in a visit because it was really, uh, for privacy reasons, we couldn't go in to visit in the clinic. Um, and so finally we said, all right, you know what? We're going to do a little role play. Um, I'm going to be the pregnant woman and Rika was going to be the expectant father. And we were like, take us from beginning to end of all the things that you, you do. And so it was really fascinating because, you know, if they had given us a script, the difference between reading that script and hearing the tone that they were using when they were talking to us, their ability to read different social cues, we sort of found a lot of things that were actually wrong with the system that we would never have been able to know if we hadn't actually gone through the role play. And from a space consideration, there are lots of little things that although the room was designed to be pleasant and calming, um, there were a lot of things that we found were actually wrong. And then, you know, for me, one of the biggest illustrations is this table was really hard for me to get on top of. 
I am a tall woman and I'm certainly not pregnant. So the fact that it was complicated for me to get on the table sort of spoke to, well, what is a pregnant woman doing getting off this? And so there were lots of things about as much as they had tried to design the most comfortable experience ever, there were a lot of things about the experience that actually didn't work well. And we found that those were all easy points to be able to fix. But it's something we would never have been able to know if we hadn't actually taken the time to immerse in the process. So when we finally came up with potential ideas, we suggested them there were kind of five areas that seemed um, issue or opportunity areas that they could engage in, um, from customer care to birth experience, loyalty, financial decision making, and family involvement. And so with each area, we sort of set up a set of insights, and then we also told them, here are some potential ideas that you could actually move forward with. Um, so I'm just going to quickly show uh, two of the ones that we came up with. So going back to that visit with Carol, um, what we found is that in her, the way that she interacted with people was actually really great for building a sense of trust. And it was also about the fact that she was literally going into their homes and building a connection, and that she was the one point person for these women who had just given birth. The way that the hospital generally works is that you get whatever nurse is on duty, so it's not like what we have here in the States where you generally have the doctor that you go to. And so we found that ability to just build a relationship with one person who kind of knew you, and also she was coming to you at your most vulnerable point, you just given a big, uh, had given birth to a baby, and particularly for first-time mothers, this was a really scary moment, that that built a sense of trust that if they were to say, I'll come back to Jacaranda, it was largely because of Carol. So we actually were trying to figure out how could we set up for them to be able to actually create these lasting relationships, not as a, a one-off or part of a small program, but actually as a sustained thing, because if women weren't giving birth at Jacaranda, then they never got to the point where they could connect with Carol. And so given that, um, giving birth was a point at which a lot of these women were being lost, we were actually starting to propose what are ways that you could start building that relationship with these women earlier. Um, so one of the concepts we came up with was this idea of my personal nurse. Um, we're actually saying, we know for efficiencies it worked to take whatever nurse was on duty, but we actually think if you want to try and save this business model, it's about building up this relationship and actually assigning people based on that nurse, and the nurse has a cohort of patients that are just hers. Um, and then with everything, we tried to give a set of next steps or low-hanging fruit that you could be able to start to pilot the ideas. Um, another thing that we found is that um, proximity was a barrier. So uh, Nairobi traffic is pretty heinous, if you've never been. Um, and a lot of women were afraid that, especially first-time mothers, we found, were afraid that if they had to sit in traffic, it would actually harm their baby if they were already in labor. And so they would end up going to whatever hospital was the closest one. And so we actually started to talk, what are ways that you could introduce some sort of transportation system that would enable these women to feel a little bit more comforted, almost the equivalent of a shuttle ambulance. Um, and then again, similar to the last one, we offered here are correct ways to be able to prototype the ideas. So what's really interesting is I think they were super excited about a lot of the stuff that we came up with, and we tried to scaffold it so there were these low-hanging Fruit. But one of the things that we found is that um, you know when we came back and did a kind of check-in with them a couple months later, that as interesting as the ideas were and as much as the next steps broke it down for them, that it was because everybody has their regular day jobs, it was really hard for them to then expand to be able to take on these additional special projects. Um, and so over time, some of the things that we have proposed are starting to seep in, um, and they're actually working with Harvard right now to do a more quantitative study around patient choice um, that will then spin off into another human-centered design project probably in 2017. So it's infiltrated, but I think um, one of the things I would say that I see is a challenge right now in the space is that you know for them, the money they use to pay for us is probably the biggest outlay that they have put out for any sort of consultant. And so how to help these organizations be able to sustain the really innovative ideas that are um, um, brought up through this process is something that I think you know a lot of us who are operating in the space are really trying to figure out how to do. Um, so the next project I wanted to talk about is one that I'm actually working on right now in San Francisco. Um, Hunter's Point, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, so San Francisco, downtown San Francisco is up here, and Hunter's Point is this area here, which is on the southeastern waterfront 
And it's kind of historically been an industrial area in San Francisco. So the Naval Shipyard um, was here. Uh, the old uh, football stadium was here. There's also the largest sewage treatment, or not the largest, but one of the top 10 uh, sewage treatment plants in the country near our residential neighborhood is here. Um, that shipyard also built and deconstructed nuclear ships. Um, and then you had my site, which is um, right over here, and it's a former power plant site. So it's a lot of environmental injustice stuff as well. Um, it's also been historically uh, a neighborhood of immigrants, but particularly since World War II, when a lot of African Americans came to work in the shipyard, it has been a strongly African American neighborhood and has had one of the highest populations of African Americans in San Francisco. Um, and it has also been a pretty strongly low-income neighborhood. So the, I wouldn't say the majority, but a significant percentage of the city's public housing is actually located in this neighborhood. So the power plant existed um, for over almost 100 years. Uh, and in the late 90s, the community came together and led by a group of mothers in the public housing um, that's immediate on the hill immediately above this, came together and lobbied pg and &E to close down the plant. PG&E finally signed an agreement with the city and the community to do so in, the late, in 1998, and the power plant was shut down in 2006 and torn down in 2008, and then a process of remediation began. Now, per the agreement with the community, the land was, um, for the majority of the site, remediated to residential standards, but then much of it was capped with concrete. Now, a lot of this had to do with the fact that uh, pg and &E was going to hold on to the land for about five to 10 years to deal with things like paper streets and various crisscross ownership with the port. Um, and the capping of the land was not for anything bad. It was just so that the clean soil that they just spent millions of dollars putting on would not blow away in this intervening period. And it's also because a lot of their sites where they are doing this kind of stuff are not located next to residential neighborhood. And so there's not necessarily normative practices to do anything different within the company. Um, but they also very quickly realized that they could not leave, um, so I should say the entire site is about 40 acres. Um, and the concrete part is probably between 20 to 30 acres. So the idea of having 20 to 30 acres of concrete for 10 years was sort of untenable in this community, and folks at pg &E very quickly realized that. And so they put out an RFP to design firms to propose interim use activation that could be done on site. And I'm part of a trio of firms that um, won that commission. And so one of the things that we proposed is instead of looking at this as some of the other pop-up tactical urbanism projects that have been done around the country where you put cool retail in shipping containers on site, we wanted to look for ways, how do we create something that is more community-based, especially because we realized that given the location of this, there was not going to be a strong retail base. I and mean, any of the retail that you put on there would likely flop as is. Um, so looking for ways that something could tie into the community, especially because the community had fought so hard for this piece of land. So, you know, if you're thinking about how we normally understand a community or an area, you know, we did our requisite assessment of the community in terms of looking at issues of health, issues of open space, food access, et cetera. But we realized that while we could get a list of needs from this, it didn't necessarily mean that's what should be put on the site. So we actually backed up the process and went and spent time interviewing some of the people who had been involved in the closure of the plant and said, well, you know, what would you like to see here? And it was really interesting, um, you know, we'd sit in their homes and the idea was it was supposed to be an hour long interview and most people would end up going for like three hours. And because they just wanted to talk, the story was so important to them. But in those three hours, they still couldn't tell us what they wanted to see. A lot of people had spent a lot of time trying to fight for the plant to close down and trying to fight for the land to be clean. They'd never gotten to the point of thinking, oh, what could we do next with it? And so we realized that um, we also needed to start to figure out ways to help them visualize it. And in particular, they'd never been able to step foot on it while it was a power plant site. It was you know, off limits. So to get them to the site to be able to start to talk about it. And we also realized that um, you know this community is one of those that's been overplanned. There's been any number of big developments um, that were supposed to happen and never left off paper for a variety of reasons. And so when we were saying, oh, we're building this and it's gonna come up in the next couple of years for you, everyone was kind of like, yeah, right, we'll believe it when we see it. 
So we realized that we needed to start to think about a way to start to build trust with this community. And so one of the things that we did get from the interviews is this palpable sense of impending loss. So this area is kind of ground zero for gentrification in San Francisco. If you can't, and you've probably have heard the stories of the rapid rising prices. If you can't buy anywhere else in the city, you can generally find a good deal in Hunter's Point. And some of the developments that have been on paper are now starting to take off, and they're mostly going to be for middle and upper income people. And so people are feeling like the old community is being forced out. And what we heard over and over again was this idea that stories were being lost, and nobody would know how amazing this neighborhood was. So we realized that one of the things that we could plug into was how to show that we had heard that and we were responding to it. Um, so we reached out to StoryCorps, who actually has a permanent booth in San Francisco, and it turned out that only a handful of stories from this neighborhood had been recorded in the five years that that booth had been open. And so we said, well, if we build a booth on our site, would you come and do recordings there? And I think they thought we were batshit crazy, because they were like, what? Okay, sure, that sounds fine, whatever you want. Let us know when you're ready to go, and yeah, we'll come and do our recordings. So we did get a shipping container. Um, but we tried to think of how we could do it a little bit differently. Um, we actually hired some local youth to help us with the conversion of the site, uh, especially because one of the other things we had heard in those conversations is you know, people of different constituencies all said, well, whatever you do on site, do something for the youth. They are the future of the neighborhoods, and they're the ones who are most in danger of being lost. Um, and so as we brought them to the site, we also used that as an opportunity to interview and interact with them. And so this is kind of what it looked like in December 2013 when we finally opened up. And I should add that like all the money that went into building this was us hijacking our community engagement budget, which typically you're supposed to be using to have community meetings. And so we sort of thought, well, this was more appropriate for that. The inside of the booth looks like this. Um, and we wanted to create it to be sort of like your family's living room. Um, so that when you are coming to tell your stories, it's a place that you feel quite comfortable. And the window actually looks out over the old power plant site. And the idea, when we recruited people to come and tell stories, we reached out to some of those who were involved in the closure of the plant. And we didn't say, come, say what you want here. We just said, here's a space for you to be able to tell your story, talk about whatever you want, bring a partner. And also, every story that's here, because it's a story court recording, is going to be archived in the Library of Congress. So no story is going to be lost. And you're also going to get a CD of that story. And so what we heard over and over again from people who came was, you listen to us. Um, and so we had people who had grown up in the neighborhood. These two women were adorable. They actually brought, their fathers had worked in the shipyard, so they actually also brought all of these amazing old photos, and one of their fathers was a poet. Um, so we ended up talking to them, and for us it was actually a really great engagement opportunity as well. While they were waiting to go into the booth or coming out of the booth, we were actually talking to them and getting additional information. Um, this woman actually is part of our pg e project team, and she grew up in the neighborhood, so she brought in her brother. Um, and I love this picture because it shows one of the indispensable things here was a box of Kleenex. Um, you know how when you hear the three-minute clip on NPR, you get a little weepy that you don't want anyone to know that you got weepy? Well, imagine 40 minutes. That I rarely see anyone coming out of the booth who's not like, oh, it's a little sad, um, but happy at the same time. And so the stories that came out of the booth were super, super powerful. Um, and then at times, people didn't come in with their partners, and so um, I had to hop in and do the stories as well. And I think it was a really helpful thing to break down that we're not these remote designers, but we're actually super connected to this place and to this project, and we want to be there to hear your stories as well. And in a very weird way, it turned out that this woman knew my mother, so we actually had a lot to talk about. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video um, that we made at the... Um, the making of the booth and all the audio in the, the video is actually from the story core recordings and having photographers videographers is actually been super important for this project because i think one of the things that sometimes happens in communities like this is everybody sort of assumes well you're out there and you're talking to somebody but it goes into a black box and they feel like they never know what's going on and so we wanted to try and be as transparent as we could with everything that was happening This is a time for us to talk. And for us to be here today looking out on the outpost of the beginning of Hunter's Point. It's future. This is where the future is. And it will be a success story.
and all of what we do is not in vain. I'm proud to serve this community. I want to see the change, but I also want to see our culture preserved here and our families preserved here. We look out and we see just this space and the water comes up to the land and just makes me think of how important it is to preserve our beauty. I don't want to waste time wishing that I did something or said something to wake up today and be alive and tell you I love you. This is a time for us to talk. And for us to be here today looking out on the outpost of the beginning of Hunter's Point. It's future. This is what a future is. And it will be a success story. had that and like I said we didn't tell anyone what to say but you can imagine that a lot of stuff that was said in there were actually things that we needed to know and wanted to know to be able to figure out what to design and so we took that video and we also uh, paid a sound editor again out of our community engagement budget to edit other clips and so then we held listening parties on site which were essentially a giant barbecues um, catered by one of the people that I interviewed who kept on talking smack about how good his barbecue was. So it was like, you gotta bring your game. Um, it was really good, actually. Uh, but we would hold these parties where we'd play the video, and then we'd also play some of the recordings. And so what's fascinating is, from the time that we were in people's living rooms and they were kind of unable to tell us what are the types of stuff that they want to see, to fast forward now where they're hearing people reminisce about these things about the neighborhood and think about what's important to them, that we then would start getting a super generative space. And because it also set up this uh, sort of dynamic where it wasn't so much us as designers preaching to them or trying to elicit in this very unidirectional way, it created a space where it was more like a conversation. And so out of that, we got some really rich suggestions, some of which we could look to how could we put that on site quickly as an event, Others how could, are long-term things, but we could start to strategize about what are ways we could test whether or not that could work. And then some we actually really wouldn't be able to try to long-term, but at least we started to get a sense more of what people were interested in seeing. Um, we started to also try to figure out what are other ways that we could engage in groups and get their input. So youth, we've tried to do a lot of stuff with. Um, we regularly hire youth for programming, and then we also run youth workshops. And so this is Chica, who's been like a stalwart of working for us. Um, and then we also tried to talk to, to young kids. Like I think in a lot of these projects, even if they're intended for little kids, we don't really have a good way of talking to little kids most of the time. So we've worked with uh, summer school programs for the last two years in the neighborhood, bringing them to site and working, uh, having artists go in and work with them. Uh, and so one of the things we do when we bring them to the site is say, hey, you get to be an architect for a day. Draw what you would like to see here. And we have a couple hundred cards now, and it, you know, it could be very easy to leave it at, I have a lot of cute pictures of kids that I could show you. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily change PG&E's mind about what they could see on the site. So out of these cards, we've actually run different types of analysis, and we can say that 21% of those cards actually say that they want recreation spaces. Or um, when we looked at a lot of the cards that had to do with the outdoors, it wasn't just about access to outdoors, but they really wanted things that they could interact with. And so now we've been able to plug that into our design of the shoreline. Um, but to this day, also, my favorite card is still the kid who suggested a dinosaur park. Um, I can't do that, but we can try to find other things we can do. Uh, so once we got on site, we realized that actually it was a great opportunity to continue doing this programming, and that the programming, in a sense, would become our community meeting. So rather than having a meeting in some hall and saying, 
come see us there. Um, we felt that if we're gonna make you come somewhere, um, come a place where you can start to visualize the possibilities of what can happen here, but also come someplace that would start to give you some sort of benefit in exchange for your time. Um, so, and some of the things we've done have been completely from suggestions. So we've done a petting zoo, which was up on there. I'm still trying to figure out how to do a skate park. Um, but one of the crazier things we've tried is a circus, which when we first proposed it to the client, I think they were about to have a heart attack. You, you want to do what? Um, and then on the day of, when they rigged up this little setup, I thought they were all going to faint. Um, but we had 650 people come the first time we did that, which was a crowd unheard of in this community. And it wasn't just people from the neighborhood, it's people from surrounding neighborhoods. And so for those of you who don't know San Francisco, Bayview Hunters Point is viewed as, as a very dangerous neighborhood to go into. So the fact that white yuppie mom from neighboring Petrero Hill was willing to come and bring her kids into the space was actually a great sign for us of being able to change the dynamic. But then also for the community, they had a sense of pride of, you're coming to our neighborhood for something. Um, and so when we did this again this past year, we had 1,300 people. Um, and we're about to attempt it again, and I don't know how many people we're going to get. Um, but the richness of these groups, I think, has been really interesting for us. And in addition to the big events, um, which all, of, all the events we do, we always partner with different groups, we've also started to have um, smaller service events that relate to things that could ultimately be a part of the community hub that we're developing to put on site. So this is a partnership with um, the local Department of Public Health. Um, health was one of the big things the community said they wanted. Job training, something that's come up a lot. We partnered with a group called Young Community Developers. Um, I'm working right now to try and find someone to do tech training on site. Um, so we had about 82 hours of programming last year, and we're hoping to expand that again this year. Um, so the final project I'm going to quickly talk through is um, Dick and Rick. And it's an offshoot of um, a collective that I'm part of uh, called the Equity Collective. Uh, we came together about two years ago, a group of seven women um, in the community engaged design space. And we were really compelled by uh, challenges that we saw in the space. We saw the rising popularity of the work, but we felt that there was a lack of criticality within it. And we wanted to find ways to be able to push that. We did a series of articles about equity in particular last spring on Impact Design Hub. And then um, we realized from those articles, people would come and say, oh, you, that's amazing. Um, and then they, it was sort of the same people that we knew who weren't doing good work. Um, and so we felt maybe there was some other way to get the point home. And so we teamed up with uh, CUP, the Center for Urban Pedagogy, who Christine Gaspar, who's part of the collective, is the ED for, and uh, Ping Su, who's a New York-based illustrator, to create Dick and Rick, uh, which is we call a visual primer to social impact design. So, once upon a time, in the land of community engaged design, there was a guy named Dick and a guy named Rick. Um, and they both really were committed to this idea of how could they help low-income neighborhoods, and they were both also designers. Um, Dick found the neighborhood he wanted to help through searching on the internet and hearing about a community that didn't have enough parks. Uh, Rick came across it by looking at a sign and finding a community meeting to talk about parks, and so he wanted to see if he could get and help them. Um, when it came time to actually doing their research in the community, uh, Dick went around with his camera and didn't talk to anyone, but took lots of great pictures. Um, Rick actually went and sat in the community meeting, didn't try to speak, he just sat back and wanted to hear what was going on and what all the issues were. Um, when it came time for Dick to present to the community, he had all of these great plans and ideas. Mind you, he still hadn't talked really to a community member at that point, um, but invited them in to hear what his plans were for the park. Uh, Rick sat in a community meetings of sort as well, but rather than presenting, he kind of sat and continued to try and understand what it was that there were need, their needs. And one of the things he saw is that not everybody was in the same place in terms of what they wanted. When Dick decided to get feedback on his plan, it was more asking whether or not he wanted the swings to be blue or red. Um, on the other hand, when Rick was engaging in the community, it was about really trying to have a setup where everybody would be able to give their input. Um, and as he did that, he began to see that, again, there were all of these complexities in terms of what people wanted and needed, and part of his job became trying to help mediate with all of that. 
when it came to who was going to work on the projects within Dick's office, it was done as a pro bono project, and there wasn't necessarily, you know, times are tight, they were really doing this out of the goodness of their hearts, and so you know, they weren't going to be able to really pay everybody, everybody was going to have to buck up and try and make this happen. Um, but with Rick, he sort of understood that because they were getting this time from the community, we wanted to also be able to value it, and value it not just saying thank you for coming, but actually figure out ways that he could stretch the budget to be able to pay for some of the youth leaders to participate. So the parks are complete, and Dick's Park actually got into a magazine, which is great, um, but unfortunately there's not really anyone using it. Uh, Rick um, also had a beautiful park, and um, unlike Dick, actually got a lot of different usage. Um, and so Dick was left with his magazine, trying to understand why no one was in the park. Um, and Rick was finding that not only within this, uh, the park was being used, but they were actually really interested in trying other projects. And so some of the youth came up to him and asked, can you help us figure out how to build a farmer's market stand? And so it's kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, uh, way to describe it. And the idea is that Dick is completely well-intentioned. Um, but there's a difference between being well-intentioned and actually acting out on the thing that you're doing. And uh, the sort of more immersive process that Rick does, I think, is kind of where we want to push people in terms of their criticality. And um, so we joke around that one of the secret subtitles, or not-so-secret subtitles of this, is how not to be a dick. And, um, <laughs> um, and I think the important thing is also to be able to say, like, we have all been dicks. I have been dicks <coughs> time, too. And my job is to learn how not to be a dick and how to be more like Rick more often. And so we wanted to use it also a little bit of humor to sort of give people a way to kind of talk about their actions in the space. And in particular, how do we start to move from a point where we're talking about um, social good, which I think is where Dick is, to more social justice. How are we actually trying to create equity with the projects that we're doing? So that is about to release out um, in the next month. We'll be putting it online, and there's also a limited print run. Um, and then I'm just very quickly going to run in through, like, here are a couple of tools that, as I feel like where my practice has been shifted to, is how to really stay more on the social justice side of the line. And so I just want to share a couple of tools that I found that's been super helpful for that. Um, so first is this idea of systems thinking. Um, which, you know, as an architect, I think a lot of the stuff that I do, you know, it's the idea of how do we create the best building or the best space possible. And I think we also talk about how do we create the best community possible. And even though my tool might be as an architect, there are all of these other things that go into plugging into how to create that, the best community. And so part of my work is either bringing people to the table or taking time to find out about all of these other issues that really contribute to creating that best community. Um, the other thing that I think is, I found to be super important is this idea of specificity, or sort of say people, not categories. Um, and so I've shown this a lot at uh, recent um, lectures, and I was sort of struck by the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and you know why is it rising now? Because this clearly is not the first time that African men and women are being murdered, nor will it unfortunately be the last time. But what is it about this time that has caused us to kind of coalesce? And I think the really interesting thing is that in this day and age, we know the names of a lot of these people who are happening. We've heard of Eric Garner, we've heard of Michael Brown, we've heard of Amadou Diallo. And there's something about knowing that name and not having a category that is super important. And so I think when we talk about the work that we do, how can we be really specific and not talk about communities in this big, general, grand tent of communities, but who is it that we're really trying to affect by the things that we're doing? Um, and how are we trying to create these places where they can come together, but understanding even within this crowd, there's a different set of interests that I need to be able to understand. Um, third tool is this idea of co-power. Um, and so I pulled this from a book called Spatial Agency that came out a couple of years ago, and I think it's a really powerful framing of understanding how when we do work in these communities, we can come in and treat this level of expertise. So as expert citizen, you know, many of us in this room, I think, are that, where we have some sort of expertise, but we're also being, um, we also have our humanity. I think expertise is often set up as this very rational, objective thing. Um, and the fact of the matter is we never lose assumptions. We always have assumptions. So it, it's better to acknowledge it than ignore it and have it rear its head somewhere. We also think people connect more with people. 
Um, and so the more you can be human in these environments, the better the solutions are. And then on the other hand, you have the citizen experts who are these uh, people who you're dealing with who will know more about what it is like to live and work in this community than you ever will, regardless of how many hours you spend there. And But they've been really empowered to think of that as expertise. So how do you not just empower them in terms of bequeathing to them, but how do you co-power them so that it actually feels like equal expertise is coming together to create these projects? And then the final tool is this idea of empathy. And in particular, I'm really interested in this idea of how are we acknowledging the pain and resilience. So not just looking at someone as a human being, but actually looking at feelings, uh, which I know is kind of a scary idea. Uh, but that in acknowledging what needs to be repaired, it's actually a really super important act that a lot of people value, and then becomes part of the seeds of understanding what you need to do. So if we go back to the day labor project, when we talked to a lot of these, um, the mostly men, um, there was a deep, deep sense of pain um, because they felt that they had come here for something better and that they were forced to work in these environments to be abused in various ways and that nobody had ever seen them. And so one of the most empower powerful things of the work that I was doing in my interactions with them was just seeing how much it meant to them to have someone sit with them in their pain and then also show that they valued them and they wanted to acknowledge their, their existence and help them be more visible. Um, so these are kind of the tools that I'll just pass on to you and uh, thank you. huge fan of yours for, gosh, 2007, that's when I first, um, 2006, because that's when we were introduced. Um, and then to hear kind of the trajectory of everything and to get caught up in what happened with the day labor station, and then to, to kind of hear these, you know, four points and the equity um, uh, cooperative? Collective. 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 I'm writing about cooperatives, so. Um, just, uh, boy, just a real pleasure to hear you tonight and, and really um, hear what you've been working on. And, if, and I was going to ask you uh, wh why you studied architecture, but now I know. It's kind of like you were brought up by social scientists and like, wow, to have that manifest in the built environment, kind of that um, sensitivity is uh, really, really incredible. Um, I have so many questions, and I know a lot of people out there have a lot of questions, too. Um, so the first one, I loved how you began where you said, um, because you started so early, you, uh, you were one of the, right at the beginning of, of all of this, um, what it was like, and you know, you've kind of seen where this uh, area of design has gone. You've lived it, you've been a part of it, and shaped it to some extent. Um, and so that was really quite interesting to see the four points, the uh, systems thinking, co-power, specificity, empathy. Um, I've never seen them combined quite like that. We all know about, you know, kind of human-centered. Um, and so there's a real clarity with this approach, I think, the way you talked about it. So I'm curious, do you think it's reflective of the time that we're living in because design, it seems like design is going in this direction, at least this next generation of designers that I think you're probably one of the people out there in the front, forefront of this, um, where people are thinking more holistically, um, where we're more co connected globally uh, for any number of reasons, people are working locally. Um, you, this is, these are kind of the points of the essay I'm writing right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, people are more cooperative, sharing power. Um, so, do you think? I, I know this this reflects really, uh, from my perspective, good practice. Um, but why have 
it seems like only now have we been moving in this direction from, from your perspective, because you have this great, you know, kind of purview, uh, having been there at the beginning now, kind of here. Um, well, I think that there's a couple of things. I think there's always been a pretty, a long history of some element of community-based design. Uh, but I think when I first started coming through it, we were sort of the forgotten children or the black sheep of the family, and oh, you guys go and you do that there. And then you know, right around 2000, 2001, when you started to have uh, architecture for humanity and public architecture come up, at least within the architecture space, uh, it suddenly started to provide a vehicle to have that conversation reach the mainstream. And I think uh, also looking at, at groups like IDEO.org who've helped to mainstream that as well. But I think that where we are facing is that the bar keeps on going up, right? And so for a while, the bar of, of social good, I think, was the high bar that we were trying to achieve. And now, I think, in light of everything else that we are seeing out there, that doesn't seem like it is critical enough. You know, we can't stop there. And I think that uh, it's, it, we are always a product of our time. And so the time is reflecting this. Like everybody across all sorts of different angles is really being forced to do some sort of critical assessment. It's not just within design. Uh, but the question for us as designers is, well, how are we engaging that environment? And I think it's good for movements to continue, to be forced to continue to move forward and evolve. One analogy that I've been using lately to sort of describe that is if you think of the sustainability movement and we had LEAD, which if you go back to 2000 when LEAD first started coming, it was like only the super left-wing firms in California that were doing that. Like, not a, it wasn't the thing that everybody did. And then gradually it crept, and somebody who was one of the founders described it to me as, think of the bell curve. And so lead for a long time is on the leading edge, and then eventually moved over to the center where everybody does it. If you don't have a lead building, you're crazy. And living building challenge became the new thing. And so the idea is you gotta keep on pushing forward. And so I think there's some of us who are like banging the social justice drum and pushing for this criticality. Uh, but I'm happy to look back and sort of see, well, at the top of the bell curve, you have a lot of people looking at this idea that there should be some imperative of social good. The fact that we've increased the number of dicks out there, um, <laughs> if we created it that so that we could be able to laugh every time we said it. But the fact that there are like many more dicks out there than there used to be even five years ago, I think is a good sign. And I think it's important then that those of us who are operating as RICs continue to push the bar of what it means to be RIC. Well, that's a great segue. Thank you. Because uh, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, equity collective, not the cooperative. And the uh, conversation that you've started online with this uh, Design for Equity initiative. Um, and so you can, everybody can go online and read these wonderful essays if you haven't read them. Uh, designforequity.org, correct? Is that, that's where it is. Um, and what you hope to achieve in the next years uh, as you move forward. I thought the, that your exploration of terms and, and definitions were very powerful, taking these kind of uh, words that um, designers often use, but then like really uh, exploring them. Um, but I noted. Um, that it was an all-woman collective, <laughs> which I, I loved and I was fascinated. And was this intentional? And if so, why? Kind of and kind of not. Um, so the original conversation that triggered the, uh, the equity collective is that all of us are part of a program called the Design Futures Forum, uh, which was started, we're about to hit our fourth year as a group that created a consortium of universities to come together and do a summer program because we were finding that a lot of schools were really interested in having social impact curriculum, or I should say a lot of students were interested in there being more social impact design curriculum, but not a lot of schools could offer it. And so this was a way to do a week-long master class um, taught by who's who within the space. And what we found the first year is that the audience of students was largely white. 
And so the imperative the next year to the schools was that that's not allowed to happen again. And so the next year, we actually got a far better uh, representation, but it got us talking about, well, what, you know, beyond all the things that we can talk about and what to do with our projects and what skills to give people, how do we talk about the diversity of this space? Because it's a little problematic if most of the communities we're engaging are communities of color and most of the people who are going into the communities are not. And so we, CERNA was super, foundation was super interested in us having that conversation. And so the next year when we met up, uh, we had a separate uh, sort of cohort training afterwards for people who were interested in it. And we brought in Race Forward to do a diversity training with us. And that, that was kind of, from that was where we got the whole, oh, actually diversity is the wrong goal to be shooting for, that actually, that's really just talking about whether or not you have all the right pieces in the room, but not talking about the quality of that or that you're aspiring to something that's about improving outcomes and not just saying you got people at the door. And so with that, we felt, okay, there's a lot more work to do on this to really treat it critically. And so then we had a opt-in process for whoever wanted to continue working on it and so <laughs> it ended up being seven women. Uh, so that's how we got to the, the all women and you know we, there are definitely our friends on the side who are the male persuasion uh, who I think we want to be able to expand. Right now we're kind of just trying to understand what it is that we've, we've created so we've done the, um, the writing, we've done Dick and Rick which we're about to release and then just recently in order to, so an issue that came up as we were presenting Dick and Rick is um, a conversation about white privilege uh, and trying to really understand what that was because that's also there playing a role in all the things that we're coming up with. So we actually worked with a trainer, um, a facilitator around that uh, in January, kind of pulled our money together to do that so that we could be able to understand how. So everything that we've done, we've done, we've tried to study and understand before we go to the point where we're like writing articles or creating Dick and Rick. Um, so it's been part of a growth period for us as well. So right now, like white privilege is the next fun topic that we are taking on. I look forward to um, however you manifest that out to help us better uh, deal, deal with that and understand it uh, in our, uh, within our design profession. I think it's critical, really important. So I think there's probably people that want to ask questions because uh, we're we only have this room until eight o'clock I think. So um why if we oh, of course go ahead. Hi question. I'll talk loud. Um I was just Hi. Oh. Hi. I was curious if you could talk I know um I what are you doing where are you from? Hi, Jack. I'm Vanessa <laughs> Alisea. Um, I work at Dattner Architects, but I'm also on the board for AI in New York, and I've, I've heard Liz speak before. Um, but one of the questions or I have for you is related to funding the projects. Um, and if you could talk about sort of the funding strategies that you've been using, and if you're, if, if you're you know, working with city governments, or like, how, how are you funding these projects? That's a good question. Uh, so I operate my firm as a consultancy. So generally, the clients are coming to the table with the funding. Uh, how they're getting the funding often is very different. So some are getting it from foundations. Some are raising it from their, their own pockets. Uh, some, so I just did a brief assessment um, trip for a small neighborhood group in St. Paul, Minnesota that uh, basically they had brought in Dr. Mindy Fullalove back in early February. She was like, okay, you need a designer now to come and look at it and recommended me. And so I gave them my proposal for what it would be to do a two-day trip and assessment and they're like, we'll get back to you. And within two weeks, you basically fundraise from the State Department of Transportation and from another local <laughs> that had um, a lot of money to contribute for a gathering that they were doing later in May. And so basically the setup was I had to speak for a little bit to the gathering. Um, and with that, they were able to bring me to, to the table. And so try and work with organizations if they don't have a ready source of funding. Um, but other times it's also about, uh, you know, you can see with some of these projects, they're like 
like particularly the pg e project that has a really long time cycle and so it's perennially an interesting challenge because there's nothing within their this project is so radically different for them that we're you know a little bit of robin peter paypal type thing of like remediation dollars are paying for this work and then the disposition dollars will pay for their work and so um there, there's a little bit of that as well and you know i talked about the first couple of things coming out of our community engagement budget which they were going to have to do anyway uh, and then, you know, there's also like these smaller partnerships that happen uh, for a short period of time. So right now I'm working on a project in Charlottesville and the setup that we did for that was we just created a six month contract. And then now in the course of me doing that consulting work for them, I probably have helped them write about five different grant applications um, that could pay for me to continue working on the project after the six months is done. So generally I do find that clients are able to come up with something, at least in the beginning, and then that kind of scaffolds that if there is a need for additional things beyond whatever a short contract is, that like I can also bring to the table the content writing for being able to get grants. Um, hi, hello, my name is Mazlet. Uh, I'm an industrial designer and I'm also running my studio here in New York. Uh, but I also happen to be Turkish, <laughs> from Istanbul. And um, almost four years ago, one of the municipalities in Turkey happened to have a space that they didn't know what to do with, and they were looking at turning into a ballroom or like a married space. So we convinced them to turn that space into a design uh, atelier, where designers would come and uh, work with the municipalities, with the locals, and either do need finding on the ground, or the municipality would give them briefs so that they could work on it. And uh, one of the biggest barriers that we have there is not on the design research side, so it's not explaining what design is on, um, on that user research phase, but more in the public policy and municipality level. So that municipality do really understand design as an agent of change, but in terms of growing that, um, we find that as a big barrier. So I was wondering if you could um, give an example or talk about what you think was useful and overcoming that. That it's useful and people not thinking of me as just a designer, but that I could be somehow a partner in change? Um, not, not on a user level, but more in the municipality uh -huh. collaboration level. Government. Yeah, well, so I think that the idea behind the process when I mentioned that the conversations that I'm having are not just with the groups that represent the quote unquote community of folks on the ground, but it's with all folks who participate in that ecosystem. That one of the things, so my clients do range from like small local group to big multinational corporations, and the conversations that I'm having with, you know, at all levels is always a little bit of what do you need to be able to succeed? Because a lot of times the projects that I'm engaging in are the first time that anyone in that company has tried anything like that. And there's a huge risk curve that you have to be able to overcome. They're usually like the leading creative lights, but they've got behind them a whole bunch of people who are not ready to jump into this line of thinking. And so I try to spend a lot of time with them. We're building a relationship with them where I understand, well, what are their needs and desires as well? What motivated them to even engage in this kind of project? And then also trying to understand, well, what's the system that you're working with? And I'll even you know, straight up ask, what do you need to be able to have a win? Uh, because you want to be able to support their ability to do so. And understanding how that, the structure that they're usually negotiating is super important for trying to figure out whether or not what you can create would actually be able to to get anywhere. So for instance, with um, PG&E, what's interesting is that um, what resonates with some of the folks who are more traditional of like, we're an energy company type of thing, is when we talk about this as a site management strategy. So if you were to have this vacant piece of land for this period of time, you wouldn't be able to control what would happen to it. You wouldn't have a community that feels some sense of stewardship over it you would actually potentially be spending more money trying to keep that site secure than something where you actually have community members participating in the stewardship for it. And so when we talk about it in the language of site management, they're like, oh yeah, I get what you're trying to say. So it's also figuring out how to be a translator of understanding, you're, uh, we're still talking about the same thing, I just figured out the language that they need to hear to be able to understand what that thing is.
Hi, my name is Leticia. Um, I just recently relocated in the area from the Midwest. Um, I was just wondering, you had touched on, for the day labor uh, project that you did, you had touched on um, going to other communities and cities around North America to look um, for research. Um, have you seen if any of those communities um, looked into their into that problem in their cities or tackled that problem? And if so, have you seen any themes in the communities? That's a great question. You've been asked that one before. Uh, I haven't, uh, because right around the time, so we sort of continued to keep the conversation going up until about 2010. And in that period of time, we were still knee deep in the recession. And you know, for the ones that we kept in touch with, we were still seeing that all the same pressures that kept them from being able to invest in it in the first place were still consistently there right about the time that we closed up shop on the project. So it would be an interesting exercise to see now that the economy has risen again, if anybody has picked up that mantle, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> hello, my name is Winston, I'm a design intern, and uh, I wanted to ask, um, because one of the things that I find that's typical about socially responsible design is you can't be very specific about it, because sometimes it's architecture, and sometimes it's poster design, and sometimes it's journalism, and sometimes it's cooking or something like that. Um, so for all these people sort of surging into this uh, industry, what advice do you usually give them? in terms of skill sets to be, essentially to be Ricks and, and not to be Dicks and, uh, and to keep sort of uh, pushing this in a positive direction. So I think the, the kind of four tools that I laid out at the end is sort of what I would say, or I think there's more, but I think those are a good start in terms of a platform. And then I think I often also get people asking, well, to what degree should I get or where should I go to school to be able to practice this? And I actually think the more important thing is get a degree in something you're really good in and that you're passionate about, but also have a good understanding of the world and how all of these other things plug in. So none of my projects, as you saw, there was always a list of like a large team or collaborators. None of my projects are ever done alone and you know I'm good at a lot of things but there are a lot of things I'm not good at and what I am good at is sort of being able to identify what are the skill sets we need to have at the table and so I think one of the things that often leads to a dick-like situation is when people feel like they're going to be the savior that they're going to come in and as a designer they're going to fix everything and I think the more that we can be open to seeing who needs to be at the table and creating, um, you know, one thing I would say that wasn't up there in the four tools was this idea of collaboration and like being able to work with others and being able to synthesize your ideas with others. And I think that's hugely important to getting at. Um, when I showed the, the system diagram and showed how there were all of those other pieces, I'm really good at the kind of architecture piece, but I'm gonna to go to somebody else who can help me figure out about the health and well-being, and somebody else who's dealing with the economic development. And just understanding how to be at the table with all of those people, I think, is also another important element to create more ricks. But you also, I think you, that Hunt's point was so incredible. It was such a wonderful example that you showed, because what you did is, like, you named, you, you built trust, right? That's, like, huge. You built something right away to show that there was some, you know, there was something behind what you were saying. I mean, it was such a beautiful, and then you listened to, the, somebody said in quotes, you listened to us. It was, and then the, you were transparent. I mean, just like one right after the other. Yeah, and she's really good at helping me all the things I forgot to say. Uh, yeah, and I, I think, you know, the other thing, and this is an interesting thing for me right now because there's, uh, particularly for my, uh, projects that are not US based that the, the most that can be sort of afforded and especially because I'm not moving over there are these shorter engagements and one of the things that I've noticed that has been super interesting with Hunter's Point and also um, Charlottesville um, where I'm working on a new project now is just the longevity of like keep on coming back and it's not necessarily like I'm coming back to hit big milestones and just coming back to do the work so um, you know, one of the folks at pg e jokes with me that like within three or four months of us starting to do the project, because I was around a lot, um, that if she showed up for a meeting and I wasn't there, people in the community would go up to her and be like, where's Liz? 
And, you know, same thing down in Charlottesville. I, like, was coming in and out for this thing, and, you know, I was giving hugs to everybody and figuring out, well, what, how's your hip feeling today? And it was just because I kept on making appearances and getting to know the people. And so I think it builds that sense of trust where, they, you know, especially because with so much of this work, it's really hard when I first scope out a project to be able to say, I know exactly what I'm going to give you at the end. And so there's a lot of trust that even my clients have to have with me of like, we're going for some journey and hopefully we'll get to someplace good at the end of it, but I'm, I'm trusting you and your process. And so I think it's not, not only with the clients, but it's also with the community that they're having faith that they're believing that I have their best interest at heart and somehow we'll get to a point at the end where there's something that we can all be proud of. I think we're almost there, but can I have one last question? I'm looking to our, uh, we have one more person, maybe we should like that question. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a designer too. Um, uh, curious to know how, Liz, you partner with um, community-based organizations because when we're working in the social justice space, there's so many people that have already been doing this work that we're doing for decades. So when you're working in communities and, and trying to figure out like, who's already sort of a key advocate, stakeholder in there, how do you partner with them? How do you find them? How do you work with them? Great question as well. Uh, so a lot of it ends up being that when we do, uh, so there's a couple of things. One, in that initial survey of folks that we're talking to, always there's a spectrum of community-based organizations that are on that list. Uh, because as you said, they have really good insight about that community and what works and what doesn't work, and it's really helpful to take that. So they're kind of covered in that first brush. But then when you get to the point, particularly with you know some of these place-based projects that I'm doing now where we're trying to do some level of activation or programming um, connected to building towards whatever the long-term project is, I always set it up that we're doing that stuff as partnerships. And so in Hunter's point, you know, we may seed a couple of the programs that we feel aren't covered by partners, but every other program that's on the list, which is the vast majority of them, there's some sort of community partner that's in there because we recognize they do that thing better than we can. And really, you know, we've talked about that project as our role here is to figure out how to build the capacity of the organizations to be able to do more. And so it's been really interesting because in our working with them, sometimes we find, okay, here are the limits of what you could do, so why don't we bring XYZ to the table to help you maximize that? And that can only be done through these conversations. We're sitting at like monthly meetings that are conveners of local base organizations. And so um, uh, Allegra Madsen, who's the project manager that we just hired to kind of do day-to-day -day programming on the site, is at that meeting every month. And I'm kind of popping into it quarterly to try and understand what's going on with different groups and how we can partner with them differently. And so I think for these things to be sustainable as designers, we're even if I'm doing a project for a couple of years, we're going to come in and eventually we are going to leave. And so the idea is what are we leaving? And to make sure that what we're leaving is not just a pretty project, but actually a full on sustainable structure that allows the things that you have found to keep on going. It really is based on looking for those groups and trying to figure out what is the capacity gap and so part of what you're designing is not just a physical thing, but also all the other programming and attic pieces that help plug that capacity gap. So I think that's, we're at the end. Thank you so much.